Hi, everybody. It's Stephen Kroll from Cybercrime Magazine. We're at the NYIT Manhattan campus today for another Ask the CISO interview sponsored by Fortinet. I'm here with Keith O'Sullivan. He's the CISO at Standard Industries. How's it going, Keith? It's going great. Thank you for having me, Stephen. Or it's a pleasure. I'm glad you can come down here on this hot and humid day in New York. Yeah, suits in New York in the summer don't really work well, but I still look good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sounds good. I have my sleeves rolled up, mm-hmm. as you know, so um, had to take the tie off, too. But so let's get going. Um, did you have an interest in computers and technology when you were in high school, even though you didn't major in computer science? Yeah, I, you know, I I grew up kind of at that time in, in the dot com boom era, right towards the end of it. So technology was just a huge industrial revolution, you could say. So um, you know, banging around on, on websites and uh, creating my own websites for stupid stuff and. Uh, you know, I really had a knack for taking apart uh, PCs and putting them back together. So I, I really enjoyed that kind of breaking things and then seeing how to go back together, but not necessarily putting them back together. Um, so, yeah, no, I had, I had a real fondness for that. But, um, you know, my focus at that time was, was kind of getting out of high school, getting into college and getting a degree in psychology of all things. So, so then how did you go from psychology to the tech field? I would take that computer lab time and I really had a big interest in that um, you know like I said creating some websites but really kind of figuring out how to break those websites was something that I was I was fond of um, I found that you know while the psychology degree was great I really felt that my talent was understanding technology understanding code understanding the hardware and uh, you know right out of school what I wanted to do was kind of get my foot in the door with with any type of business on the tech side and um, that's what I did with my first role so so I just have to ask, I'm curious. So when you were talking about breaking websites, could you share some of the things that you did? Or uh, It's on record, so I probably should. <laughs> no, it, it, you know, it's, it, back then in the 90s, it was really easy to, mm-hmm. to do things like that. Um, you know, now you have guys like me that are stopping you, but the CISO role didn't really exist back there. So when I say things like that, it's really just you know, friends um, you know, playing around with each other's websites, putting up pictures of kitty, kitty cats and things like yeah. that. When, they didn't want to, but nothing, you know, nothing, nothing bad, nothing. Yeah, well, the statute of limitations is gone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> so, okay, but. All right, so then you said you wanted to get into a tech role at any business. So did you teach yourself IT, and then how did you really begin with information security? Uh, you know, I, 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 I was fortunate to have a brother that was in the tech field. Um, you know, he was a developer, and uh, he kind of guided me on, on that first role to get, and he basically said, just get, get in the industry. And I, I seriously started from the ground up. I took that first help desk role, and I, I went from there. Four months into that, I was learning as much as I possibly could, and I realized that the next step was to, was to go into consulting. Um, if there's anything you know about consulting is they throw you at a project and say, uh, you know, Keith is the expert in, in X, Y, and Z, and you're not really, but you better figure it out fast. And it really taught me how to learn technology quick and, and fast. And um, uh, you know, I took the opportunity every role that I had to to understand not only the technology, but how to break that technology, how to how to go through logs, how to you know really understand what the the person is doing with that technology as mm-hmm. opposed to the technology process itself. So um, it was it was a lot of fun. I was I was really interested in it. So c- instead of like in the trenches, you were sort of in the wires, kind of working. Yeah, I, I would find myself just reading logs all day long and seeing what people are doing on a, on a website in particular, and um, you know what information was in there, and um, then trying to figure out how to protect it. You know, what, I had a meeting one time where we were going over kind of an application development process and an app, and I was in middleware support, which was kind of DevOps back then. Um, and there was a head of security, I guess you could call them, and he came in, and, and the only thing he asked about the application was, is there a password and is it eight characters? And I thought, if that's the only thing that he is going to look at from a security standpoint, this thing will be broken in five days or someone will get in in this five days. And I thought, you know, that industry is really starving for people that think a little bit differently and think more like the bad guy as opposed to the, the cyber cop, so to speak. So um, that's where I really kind of focused on, and I got lucky where... There was an application security manager role that opened up at um, an insurance company, and they were really starting that program. And you know, my background, I really kind of forced my way into that role and building that program. And I was really proud of uh, you know, you know, developing secure code and running tests around that. And that was a little pioneering back then. And uh, you know, that's where it kind of blew up from there as far as security went. I had an opportunity in my career to either go down a developer track or go down to the security track. And um, you know, I think I picked the right one. 
That's great. So it seems like you've had a few different roles, but you've also worked across major brands from healthcare, media, manufacturing. What's the same, maybe what's different as it relates to protecting these different industries and organizations? Right, yeah. So, I mean, the same thing as people. I mean, they are the target always. Um, they still are. They were back then. They are, they are every day. I mean, that's the easiest way to get into an organization. Um, you know, what's different is maybe the data. Uh, but, you know, in my sense, it's all data. Data is data. We're protecting either intellectual property, uh, sensitive data, regulatory data. It's still data and it still needs to be protected. But the way to get into that, I've always found 90% of the time is through the person. Um, so that's always the same, whether it's in manufacturing or insurance or pharmaceuticals or media. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I want to touch upon that idea of, you know, say social engineering. Um, we often hear that employees are the weakest link when it comes to security. Phishing email scams are responsible for a large number of cyber, t- cyber attacks. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, they, they, they still are, and they, they will be. Um, I, I remember, you know, going back uh, maybe seven, eight years in my career, uh, I was at Time Inc., and uh, we pushed out the first kind of phishing campaign, and we did that without the actual products like uh, that are on, on, on the market now, like Fish Me and, and No Before. Um, we actually wrote our own phishing attacks, um, and, and it was it was a really a PR campaign to get approval for that because you you were attacking your own employees and people didn't think about that back then. Um, but when you showed that 50% of the employees actually clicked on any link, no matter what it is, going back to pictures of cats, I put a picture of cat in there, they'll click on it. Um, you know, it showed a need for that awareness program. Now, today, when you know when I look back at that, I was really trying to get those clicks down. I was getting them to stop doing that. You know, really what I focus on now and in the last couple of years is people are going to click on something. It's do they alert the right people? Do they bring it to information security? When they, when they click on a test, are, are they saying, oh, you got me, good one? Or are they hiding and running to make sure that you don't take away their access? I've seen a good amount of leaders in industry take that approach where they, you fail a phishing test, we take away your access. And I feel that draconian approach to to security doesn't necessarily work because people will find a way to not let you know that they've done that. Mm. And um, my focus is really kind of bringing that awareness as opposed to that draconian approach. Yeah, positive reinforcement, right? Absolutely. Uh, It's the psychology major. Yeah, there you go. (laughs) Um, So then do you think it's important to have this ongoing reinforcement throughout your phishing campaigns or simulations? Oh, yeah. It's it's, it's important to have ongoing everything. Um, The bad guys, bad girls out there know what we're doing. They know the tools we have. They know the process we have. They know the types of individuals that are watching what they're doing. So they will always look for the weakest link. And, again, it is it is the employee. So if you're not constantly having awareness and doing phishing exercises or having them aware of what the cybersecurity program does, um, you're, you're going to be in trouble. So um, I think it's, it's a constant focus. It always will be. Um, tools are great, but tools are built off some kind of threat that already happened in the past. And if we can't kind of fix that one threat of, of the people – link, then, uh, you know, we'll be failing. Yeah, absolutely. So back to your um, previous career or say like the differences that you have, can you understand what a CISO is responsible for at a large enterprise or could you tell us? Yeah, it's interesting because it's different no matter where it is. I think there's, you know, they have a hard time. They'll throw that title at, at a lot of people, but uh, for me, what it really is, is, is it's, the, it's the, the highest point in an organization with the person that cares the most about security. So the, the person that, you know, day in, day out is worrying about protecting that company. Um, you know, when I say CISO, I, I, you know, I, I think of a person that's preventative, proactive, not someone there that's going to react when the incident happens. It's somebody that's constantly thinking of the emerging threat, thinking of the, the, the vectors out there that are going to come at you, thinking about ways to prevent that from happening, not necessarily react to it. So to me, it's super important that that, that individual is, is part of the business. It's not necessarily an IT function. They, they are a chief information security officer that understands the business that they're protecting. Because at the end of the day, um, you know, if you ask me why do I do what I do, I do it for the definition of security, which is to remove the threat or danger. And that's really what my role is at the, at the highest level. Would you say then that your educational background, like work with learning about the business side of things or interacting with the other executives? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I have a psychology degree and we've kind of hit on that a couple of times, but I, I use it every day. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's the science of people. And, uh, you know, this is all about 
you know, uh, breaking technology. But again, the, you know, the, the, the one way to get into that is always through the people. So understanding the business and the people and your employees is super important um, uh, for me to be successful. So then how many companies, locations, or employees are you responsible for protecting? Yeah, so Standard Industries is, is, is a large organization, about 180-plus manufacturing facilities. Um, you know, the, the responsibility there is, is for the for overall security strategy. Um, what I can tell you that is as far as any program, whether it's in manufacturing or, or uh, pharmaceuticals or whatever, um, you know, that type of program that you built, uh, I've always kind of focused on the quality of the team as opposed to the quantity. Um, I think it's really important to have individuals that really want to do that function. And, and like I said, they, they do, I asked that interview question all the time. I said, why are you in security? Can you define security? And if they treat it more, treat it more like draconian, like we were saying before, that's not what I'm looking for. I, I'm looking for somebody that actually wants to remove that threat, not necessarily tell the employees they can't do something, but remove that threat and be more preventative and proactive, more of the firefighter approach as opposed to policeman approach. You know, we want to we want to save the kittens out of the trees, not necessarily give you a speeding ticket. I don't know why we keep talking about kittens, but uh, <laughs> because we're yeah. going back to the yes. dot com days. <laughs> exactly, That's why. Yeah. <laughs> um, LOL cats. Yeah. <laughs> Cat emojis are my favorite. Uh, told, everybody will click on us. Absolutely. Mm. So, how many people work underneath you then in information security and cybersecurity roles? Uh, you know, I've had large teams. I've had uh, had small teams, and again, going back to the point where I think it's really important that you have the individuals that care about what they do. Um, you know, you know, I think you probably get to a question later about the you know the lack of talent that's out there and the, the open roles we have. And I think we don't necessarily have to fill those with bodies. We, we should be filling with those people that are focused on information security and, and want that job necessarily for the paycheck, but because they love what they're doing. Um, so as far as size of teams, you know, I've really kind of kept the, kept those small as opposed to building an army where somebody's just putting a bu- pushing a button somewhere. Um, I think that that's a benefit to them as well. You know, it builds their career to be able to learn different aspects of security, not just be that governance risk and p- compliance person, but also be able to do a pen test or, um, you know, be able to, to check code to make sure it's secure or be able to respond to an incident. I think when you have that quality in that smaller team, those people are now able to go on and, and build programs themselves. So as you know, we're in the midst of a cybersecurity worker shortage right now. Cybersecurity Ventures predicts that the industry will fall short 3.5 million jobs by 2021, up from 1 million in 2014. How difficult is it for you to recruit, and not only that, but retain cybersecurity people in a highly competitive environment? Yeah, so recruiting is, is the is the hardest part. The re- retaining, I find it a little bit easier because um, actually ties into the recruiting piece. But, um, you know, I really look for uh, the same type of person I was back in the day, not necessarily a college degree in cybersecurity, um, somebody who likes to break things, somebody who likes to think that way, like the bad guy, bad girl. Um, you know, that's what I really focus on. And I go to a lot of conferences like B-Sides and DEF CONs and um, black hat and, and, and look for those individuals and, and talk to those individuals and, and, and try to recruit them myself. That's the first piece. Second piece is really working with the, the corporate HR department recruitment, um, you know, having them focus on certain types of requirements that, you know, that I'm looking for and kind of educate them on, on what to look for on LinkedIn um, for certain individuals. You know, I, I was looking on LinkedIn the other day and, and someone had um, – Someone had their title of chief breaker of things. I was like, let's let's hire her. Let's get her over here. So that, that, those are the types of things that I look for. Um, you know, and one of the pieces also with with the recruitment is uh, we tend to put a lot of requirements in our job descriptions, 10, 15 requirements that are really hard to meet. I mean, if I had a requirement for my role, I probably wouldn't wouldn't meet it either. And people tend to shy away from that if they don't hit maybe 80 or 60 percent of it. Mm-hmm. Um, we do have to trim those down a little bit and, and just try to get the talent in the door and then, you know, kind of mentor them and, and push them in certain directions. But it's huge if somebody has a GRC or governance risk and compliance background and they can get in and they can do things like pen testing. You know, they'll be happy to do that. People are in this role not for the money. They're in this role for the love of security, hopefully, and to be able to constantly learn and, and be that breaker of things. Yeah, so you're looking for someone, it sounds to me like, who's, who's always curious and wanting to progress within their career, yeah. or at least within their security knowledge. Oh, absolutely. And I, I think that ties to the retainment piece. You know, if you're constantly having them 
learn things. You know, we'll, we'll talk about cloud later. But it, you know, if if they're getting involved in building a security framework for maybe AWS or GCP, that's huge. I mean, they put that on a resume. They're one of a couple of thousand people in, in the world that are able to do that. And when you look at these open roles that you're going to have, I mean, you know, they want to stick around and keep learning. And then, you know, I, I like one of the biggest compliments I can get is when I see somebody that that's in a program that that I've built and. They went on and they're running their own program somewhere else or building their own program. That, you know, I, 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 there's no bigger compliment than that. So I know that I've helped them move in their career and learn every aspect of security to be able to do this themselves. So, yeah, that's, that's really good. That's, you know, yeah. securing other organizations and other oh, people. Oh, yeah, it's a little selfish too because then they do it the way I did it. So, you know, with yeah. some minor tweaks. You should copyright it or patent yeah, it yeah, then your right. system. Yeah. So then you just mentioned the cloud. Does that make it easier, more difficult when it comes to implementing security and protecting a large enterprise? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I love I love my cloud, um, and I love security in the cloud. There's probably three, and when I talk about cloud, I'm more I'm talking more about infrastructure as a service. So AWS, uh, GCP, Google, uh, Azure from Microsoft. Those are kind of the the big boys that play in that space. They all kind of do security a little bit differently. Um, so is it is it is that good or bad? You know, I always see the positive in that. I think it's an opportunity to be able to build a framework from scratch. Um, you know, be able to work with the business as we were talking about before, and embed security into that. If you sit around and wait for the vendors to have tools to help you, uh, you'll be far behind, and then you'll be one of those numbers that was that was compromised. To be honest with you, so. Um, I, I, I love that opportunity, and I, I love having people on my staff that welcome that and, and want to be a part of that. It's interesting, you know, um, AWS is huge, and, and, and there's you go to reInvent, which is a big conference that they have, um, you know, in the fall time, and uh, there's hundreds of vendors and, and dozens of security vendors. You go to the, the, the Google Cloud um, uh, conference that happened a couple months ago, and there's not that many um, security vendors because... They're not necessarily new in the space, but they're focusing themselves on their own security stack, um, which you know is great to see. And if you're a part of that and learning that, you're going to be, like I said, one of a couple of thousand people in the world that know that, as opposed to, let's say, on Amazon, you're one of a couple million people that understand it. So there's such an opportunity there for people to grow a career and and be in a forward-thinking, probably you know, type of uh, security discipline. Yeah, it sounds good. And then, you know, talking about forward thinking, as you know, IoT devices are proliferating. And we hear that IT and security teams can barely keep up with securing them. What are some of your thoughts on IoT devices? Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, obviously I have, an, I have a Amazon Echo in my house, so it's listening all the time. And do I worry about the security of it? Yeah, but it's probably just hearing me tell the dogs it's time for dinner. So, you know, no, no big deal. And you can also turn it off. But, um, you know, IoT is kind of everywhere. There's there's no way around it. If you if you have a an office building, you know, there there's systems that control just you know uh, the security cameras or the doors. Um, those are all connected usually to a Wi-Fi or to the internet somewhere. And what I found, and you know, there was a, a former colleague of mine who kind of just you know enlightened me on how you kind of secure that and and. You know, the way to look at it is those systems all have to talk to one network, and there is some bottleneck somewhere. So you see some kind of technology out there that's coming out in a security space that's monitoring that traffic as opposed to monitoring the individual systems, let's say the echoes or the light bulbs, um, for anomalies and behavioral kind of security incidents and things like that. So they're catching up a little bit, but, um, you know, I always say that the bad guys, bad girls of the world, again, realize the tools we have, so they realize the ways around it, um, but they're also opportunistic, and if it's easier to just fish your employee, they'll do that, as opposed to kind of trying to crack, uh, you know, your Amazon Echo that's that's in the CEO's office, which hopefully Yeah, that's true. Have, you know? uh, they're looking to make a, a quick buck in the easiest way that they can. Yeah, yeah. And, and let me tell you, I, I really respect uh, those, those people, actually. You know, I... You know, coming from a long time ago, thinking that same way that, you know, I, they, they are the reason I'm in a job. So, um, you know, I respect the way that they look at things and try to break into that. And, um, you know, it's one of the things where, you know, uh, you know, I think if we all got in a room one day, we'd all kind of share our war stories and talking hackers and security people. I think that would be kind of an interesting uh, dinner. Maybe we should do it. I was going to say, it sounds like you created a new series. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Although, Hacker versus CISO, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Though we'd probably have to do some of it sort of yeah. anonymous somehow. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, so then, Mask. 
Yeah, a mask. So aside from collaborating with hackers, which you want to do, uh, that's a joke, um, do you collaborate or you have a network of CISOs where you bounce ideas off of each other? Is there sort of, um, I don't know, like organizations or cooperation? Yeah, no, I, absolutely. Uh, you know, we help each other. We're one of those weird, you know, kind of roles where, um, you know, you have you have tech roles, executive tech roles in, in a company and they have a peer or they have people they can bounce things off. But uh, my type of position, there's really nobody else in the organization that you can ask for advice. So it's super important to have that network outside of the organization. I think, you know, 10, 15 years ago, we probably weren't. So we didn't communicate very well, but now, you know, that, that is a big part of it. You know, they kind of get the pain, they get the stress, and it's really good, especially in, in, in the industry. If you stay within the industry, you understand the same types of uh, hiccups that you may have. So uh, that, that's a big thing for me. Um, you know, I, uh, it also, on the flip side of that, uh, frustrates me a little bit because I, I see my peers in the industry and I see the way that they're doing things, and you feel like you want to tell them, like, that necessarily is going to work. You know, going back to the draconian way of, of security, mm -hmm. I feel like it's it's very old school, and and we need to think differently. Uh, we need to be part of the business, part of development. We need to have, you know, there's DevOps where developers are doing operations. We want DevSecOps. We want security in the middle of that. If you take that different approach and fight those things, I find that those are the individuals that are that are having uh, issues. So um, you know, it's a balance. So I, mm -hmm. I love my peers. I love bouncing things off them, but sometimes I get in there and I say. This is not what we should be doing. We should be changing this. Yeah, and hopefully they listen to you. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add about security or just anything you want to touch upon that we may have overlooked? No, I. I, I mean, I. I love what I do. I still, you know, I still get up every day and I come into work and I. I love uh, every aspect of it. Um, you know, there's obviously stressful times and and there's positive times, but again, when I when I surround myself with really talented people and, and you know i'm fortunate in the organization I'm, in, I'm at now that you know from the executive level down is just, it's a lot of talent and i've never really seen that before in any organization i've, I've seen some pockets of it but this it, it, it's really fantastic it's standard um but you know i get the opportunity to kind of bring people into that and, and show them you know the good side um you know that that's kind of what i'm focusing on now that's nice so I just want to thank you another time, Keith, for coming down today. This is a great interview. It's an Ask the CISO interview sponsored by Fortinet, and we really appreciate your time. Thank you, Stephen. I really appreciate it. Don't click on that, that email with the cats in it. I'm going to send you after this. I can't. I love cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.